in a sense, you have to say it was different but the same, because Carroll came at it from a naturopathy point of view. And to a large degree, he did as well, because the essence, I was just looking through the Brian May notes, the essence of the naturopathy thing is that, and also, what the Michael Mosley thing was getting to in the Horizon program is that a fast is an eliminative process. Um, the essence of which is your body tunes into eliminating processes which are causing problems, toxins we call them, or things that you shouldn't ought to have inside you. Or too much of a certain thing inside of you gets eliminated. And I suppose the thing which turns me on about it is that what you're doing is nothing. You're not giving it anything more to deal with, so your body gets on with the process of sorting itself out. And one of the, the striking things in the, in the Michael Mosley program, I don't know whether you've seen it, but do have a look at it because it's good. He starts off with the, the first fast he does is for, I think it's four or five days. And um, it is confusing in that he doesn't actually show you sort of a timetable of what he's doing. He, he just describes it and then they discuss other things, so you're not quite sure about what he's actually doing. The first one he does is remarkable because he does a four-day fast. He's a normal guy, I suppose he's slightly chubby. He's not what you'd call fat, and um, previous programs he's been doing exercise, so he's a fairly healthy guy, I would say, in his 50s. And the, the bloods he goes in, the bloods they and tests they gave him when he first goes into it are that he's got um, precursors for diabetes and for cancers. Um, there's this bit of showing that these are the things which are in his bloodstream and say that, you know, within 10 years he'll start to develop something if he doesn't sort himself out. His cholesterol is very high. And there was another thing as well, a fourth one, which I've forgotten. Anyway, he does the four-day fast and they take his, his bloods again. I think it's about a week later. And they say he's halved his cholesterol. He's halved his um, precursors for diabetes. And this is a total fast, eating nothing. Yeah. So. Um, well, it, it wasn't that. He was allowed small amounts, but it's a very, very low calorie diet. And they, what, what is surprising is the doctor actually says to him, um, Dr. Mosley, because he's the doctor's all, there's nothing we could have given you, there's no chemistry we could have given you in, that would have reduced it in four days. So what you have to say is, and what they don't say is, your body has cured you <laughs> in four days by itself. Mm -hmm. So what the big thing we've got, to, we've got to catch on here is, you're doing nothing, and the bloody thing is working by itself. Mm -hmm. So that's the key, if you like. Mm -hmm. You're doing nothing. The, the body has got its own intelligence. And one of the things, that, one of the quotes I was going to do tonight, I've got a sheet here with some of Eugene's quotes, and one of the one is, he says to, he's talking to a friend about, doing a fast. And Fred and Fred said, well, that's all very well, but he said, you know, your body can't heal itself all the time. What if you broke your leg? You'd have to have it, you'd have to have it manipulated. You'd have to have it set. And Halliday comes back and says, yes, you would have to have it set. But then it would heal by natural process. And the natural process is not something that you do consciously or deliberately. And it's not like the manipulation which you put in the thing back. But even if you didn't manipulate, it would try to heal itself. The natural forces inside you would work at the bone ends and they'd work at the flesh. And if you put them together, it's still the natural forces that are curing it. You know, his point being that if you can stimulate those and if you can allow them, they will start to act and work in you, which is the basis of behind the Mosley thing as well that you're stopping taking stuff in so that the body's natural processes because it doesn't have to absorb it can just eliminate and he was even saying it seems to trigger off better responses in people they seem to become more intelligent in, you know in that when you're full of food you're slower and slightly dimmer and he said that would work it seems in terms of evolution he actually discusses this because a hungry animal needs to find food and a, and a full animal doesn't and if you look in the natural world, certainly with the predators, they're only active when they're hungry, and then they will often spend days relaxing, digesting a vast amount of food. So they tend to go from, from 
too much to, well, too little, mm -hmm. and then they're out hunting again. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a rhythm, if you like. And they were saying that what they think is happening, and they still don't know, which is going to be another thing about mm, the talk I'm going to give. What they think is happening is that the body is using this time when there's no new impetus coming in to allow itself to auto heal sort of thing they say, the immune system suddenly starts to work and it does sort of works far better than anything they could give you is the unspoken thing that's, that's behind it. So in some way it stimulates these it stimulates these natural processes. Right, I've got a song sheet for you so if you can grab one and, and, and pass it. A lot of around. singing going on tonight. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. absolutely. <coughs> Sounds like you're in voice as well. <laughs> Well, yes, and that's what seems to sort of happen naturally, isn't it? That you tend to to want to eat like that. Um, well, certainly I do. Uh, you know, I tend to eat tons and tons of junk food when it's when it's cold. I think you want things like that. And when you've got a, a fever, you tend not to want to eat. Now, it, this is it's great to be talking. But uh, we're hot off the presses tonight. Some of this stuff is state of the art. Okay. The first part is Eugene, mostly taken from Health and Spiritual Freedom, which was written in 1956. There are some writings by Eugene floating about at the moment, and I always tend to find that the earlier ones are more powerful than the later ones. And this stuff was written for the Cavendish Healing group which is in Manchester, not far from uh, the, uh, the university, and <coughs> it's for people who are healers, and these things are mostly taken from a series of uh, articles he did for their magazine. Now, I've tended to lift chunks out, and where I put the, the speech marks, you can see I've gone on to a slightly different part of the, sa of the same article. Okay? Wholeness is health. It's unity he's talking about. And wholeness and health come from the same root word, he would say. Um, when I call this part of my talk sacrifice, that's a direct quote from, from him in conversation. And most of the fasting he spoke about was in conversation. I couldn't find much written down. Now, I think he's done that personally because... He could recommend it to individuals, and he spoke to individuals, but he didn't make it public for the reasons that Carol's given. It's a dangerous thing to do. Now, he once said to me, when you look at yogis, you have to realize they're experimenting with themselves. They're trying to find out what is possible for a human being. They are scientists experimenting with themselves. It's not all healthy stuff they do stand with one arm in the air for three or four years is not a healthy thing to do. What it does is it tells you what is humanly possible. If you look at the guy, they've got photographs, um, they'll be on the net now, but I remember seeing photographs of, the, of a yogi who stood with one arm in the air. And, I mean, health and beauty. So he said, you have to realize that initially they were people who were experimenting with themselves. And the postures and stuff that we see now are an organization that has been foisted onto what they were doing. They were finding out about themselves. And fasting was one of the things they did because it was very effective. It's called fasting because it gets you there quicker, is what he used to say. And it's a sacrifice. <laughs> it's a sacrifice because it's a sacred fire. He said it means making, making sacred, so it makes you sacred. That's what the origins of the word mean. But he said if you interpret it as a sacred fire, you're burning yourself up. You are literally burning yourself at both ends to find out what it's like and what you're made of. Okay? So wholeness to him is health. Disunity is plurality. There's too many things going on inside of you if you're feeling unwhole or unhealthy. Now, wholeness is when those things agree and complement each other. And disunity is when those things, for some reason, fight against each other. And all forms of unhealthy, you would say, is where one part of you is out of sync with the rest, or more than one part is out of sync with the rest of you. And it happens mentally, it happens
happens emotionally and it happens physically. So you can be mentally out of sync with yourself and unwhole, emotionally out of sync with yourself. There are some feelings inside of you that are fighting with others, and you can be physically literally unwhole because there are parts inside of you which are fighting other parts. You're being torn apart. Or as Jesus said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. So, wholeness is health, disunity is plurality. How do we humans come to lose our wholeness, our at-oneness? We have, each of us, a material body. This material body is constantly assailed by the sights and sounds, the smells, taste, and contacts of the world. Every sight we see, every sound we hear, every reaction to the world, tends to destroy our wholeness. This comes from a sense that, and a bit later on I'm going to do some quotes from Sheldrake because he, he, he seems to have caught the, the angle of this. Eugene's point was that inside you, literally, you have an energy which is perfectly balanced, whole in itself, and it is streaming into you. Now, Sheldrake points out that we talk about chi, and prana and ki and all the systems of the eastern systems of health like yoga and tai chi etc and it's thought of as a metaphor but of course it wasn't a metaphor for the, for the originators of this thing they found an energy inside of us that was generating unity and wholeness and health and what was interfering with it is the world because we go out into the world and it knocks chunks off us you know, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune are the things which constantly hammer us from the outside world. We would talk about pollution and stress, and the, this was essentially his point. We get stressed essentially because we're taken into situations which generate fear. We cling to things that we that literally are not part of us and not, we can't really control. So our world gets distorted by emotions that we have inside of us ideas that we get attached to, and also the habits that get built into us. We're coaxed into things, they become assumed by us by repetition, and they take us away from ourselves. So this is the, the sense of stop the world, I want to get off. There's so much at it coming at us, we get pluralized, if you like, we've got so much going on. There's no unity to it, there's no oneness or atonement going on inside of ourselves. We're, we're losing sense of it. Does that is that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, he's coming at the whole idea of fasting from that point of view. And in terms of fasting, what he's actually talking, or what he ever talked about to us when we, when we were actually discussing with him, and he's in some of the talks actually, but none, none of his, his writings that I could find, he's talking about depriving your, yourself of something. Not so much because it hurts, but to find out what happens when you do to see what the need is like. In yoga we have a thing called vrittis. And a vritti is a whirlpool in the mind which has been set up by people literally stamping something into you. So they often, Eugene used to draw it, he used to say, okay, there's the self. your sensorium, you used to say. It's the sensitive part of you that is literally responsive to the world. And inside, it's got the center. Now, because of your skin surface, what he means by the world is too much with you, and you constantly get hammered by the world is, we get stimulated. Some people come in and touch our skin surface, or our senses, our sight, our hearing, our taste, our touch. And when it touches us, we respond. It literally ripples across us. And the first few things that go in are terribly important. So Freud is right in the sense that the earlier the stimulus comes in, the more powerful it is because there's nothing to resist it. But after a while, we've got so many resistance, we've got so many repetitions inside us, we have patterns starting to form inside here. Now, luckily for us, we have things called parents and the parents will give us something which is called an ego. And the ego is created by a repetitive stimulus, usually associated with a name, okay, and for 
sentimental reasons on Kotlimala. Okay? And they will tend to say, these stimulators will tend to say, Alan does this. Alan doesn't do that. Alan will do this. Alan sleeps here. Alan eats his dinner. Alan doesn't draw on the wall with his crayons. You've, you've all been there. It's programming, isn't it? It's programming. And what that builds up is an association here with the name Alan does, and Alan does not, down here. And there's a tension between them, which creates a personality, which is what we would call the ego. The ego is a Latin word that just means I am. I, it means actually, sorry, I have added the am on. So in using the word ego, we're actually talking about something here, which is a fixation. Now, when you once you've got that, which may or may not associate with the center of your being, it depends how intelligent your parents are. If they involve your sensorium in that, you can be quite enlightened and have an ego which includes part of your center. The center, in he, as far as Eugene was concerned, is consciousness. It's purely a word of itself. It's a sense of beingness. Totally, you had it there in the first place. You knew you were alive. You knew you were you long before you had an ego long before you were trained in any form whatsoever. So that repetition there, which which builds up into an egotistical framework, which Freud would then say starts to frame the personality or the mask, as Jung would call it, is the thing which is actually at a certain point blocks the sensorium. It stands in front of all the sensitive responsiveness which you had before, gets in the way. And because you use the Alan as a reference, your name tends to be tied up with this particular thing. So as you respond, you go into that center to remember and to be reminded of how you respond. Is this craning going on the wall? You know, is this literally something I should be doing or something I shouldn't be doing? And then before you respond to the world, you have to refer to this egotistical structure, which of course is not fixed and is constantly changing week by week, day by day. Hour by hour. Yeah. I may have mentioned to you that bef before that you're so caught up with your own self-image that sometimes you'll look in the mirror and you'll be extremely good looking. An hour later you look in the same blasted mirror and you're hideously ugly. It's the same you. What's coming at you is an input. You, it's this thing which is changing. The way you're reading and reinform reinforming yourself. It's changing the way you're looking at the world. You can, by talking to somebody and describing them, make them see the world as an open, beautiful cherry to be plucked, or a hell of a trap that has got you nailed into a tight corner and you'll never get out. You can describe the world in one way or another. And if you look at read stories and look at films, you can see that they are actually tending to do that. They will shock you in certain ways. They will teach you, teach you that you're a wonderful person and so we use that ego to actually <coughs> make a reference that it starts to get between us and the world. It starts to be between the way you see things, you structure things before you even see them. They've done all sorts of tests on that and they can actually um, record literally information, pass it to somebody and they won't hear certain words if they're of a particular type. If they're a particular type of person, they won't hear the swear words. They literally don't register them. Register them. They can't, if, if, when they read them, they will try to interpret things in a different way. So this ego, ego eating even interferes with the way you see, the way you hear, the way you smell, the way you talk, even the way you taste food. So the way you describe things, this is why the advertising industry is so per, you know, pervasive all around us. They have to tell us what we'll enjoy, and they do it over and over again. And they catch us literally, usually they they recognize a particular type of ego based on class more than anything else, literally how the available amount of cash and stuff we have, and they will catch us with that. If you can actually see the scales, the class levels of the advertisements when you're watching TV, you can see the way they're trying to slant it and the different type of language that they use. You know? It does what it says on the tin. There. You know, nothing flowery. It's not meant to catch you in anything it says it's purely practical type of person that they're appealing with a purely practical product. With other things they show you what you'll get. You get a kid of seven, you can bend them, twist them, tie them in knots. It's great. 
that you lose that facility as you get older. I know what that's like. Field you know? converges upon its forms. And I used to I used to wonder why he always calls us creatures and actually creatures of the field. Yeah. You know, that used to bother me a lot yeah. years ago, but now I understand what he really meant. You've been created and we've yeah. stuffed ourselves with, with I mean what he used to say is don't forget your body your bones are alive to the degree of which that they they are gelatin stuffed with calcium and as you get older there's more and more calcium in your system <laughs> there was a scientist on the radio the other day who says we actually become like toffee the cells of our body become more viscous as we get older we become more fibrous you can if you look at an old person they're more fibrous and more viscous and they move in that sense we're turning into toffee it sounded lovely to me I, you know, <laughs> Soft spot for <laughs> so for health's sake, for wholeness' sake, for holiness' sake, notice he's linking those words, health, wholeness, and holiness, for these are all one ultimately. We must learn to resist the disruptive forces which come to us from the external world. Okay? The word freedom is made of two words, free and dom. Free means not in bondage, not under compulsion, Dom is the old English word for judgment, decree, or sentence. So freedom means the state in which a non-compelled judgment is made. Okay? Non-compelled. If the Vritti is talking, you're being compelled. You're not smoking the cigarette, the machine is. At a certain point, that machine will run your life. It will take over completely because you're a network of patterns that run your day. And there's no longer a human being in there. You know? You can sometimes stand next to somebody and you realize that it's virtually automatic. You know, they are ticking over and you must prevent that from happening inside of you. Originally, you would say all those habits saved you from a situation. You took them on board because they were helpful, but they've been established inside of you. First time you do something, it's a root. Then it becomes a routine. Then it becomes a rut. He said if you keep going round and round and round in it, the root becomes engraved and it becomes your grave. It's repetition. First time, it's a free act. First cigarette, I'll try it out. It doesn't taste very nice. I don't have another one. I'll go and have another one. Okay. Yeah, you've had about 10 and everybody else is smoking. You think, I can do this. I can get away with it. I can pretend I like it. Within a month, you're good. If you keep doing it, the routine gets deeper and deeper. It gets engraved into your tissue. It's then extremely difficult because the nerves, no, it, the, the nerves want a cigarette then. You know, there's an appetite which is being built into you. So it becomes worse the longer you persist. Originally it was a free act and then it, it becomes a bondage. If we find that in some way our actions are restricted by forces other than our own free will, we are in some degree of bondage. Okay? So in other words, if you can't stop it, you're trapped. Deliberately stop it to make yourself come out of the trap, even for two minutes. It's a bit of freedom. Once you do that, that freedom grows. That you're free. You're as free then by stopping it for two minutes as you'll ever be, because you're not doing it. You know? Remember, Oscar Wilde said the only way to get rid of temptation is to give in to it. <laughs> he said, yeah, but you only get, it only goes away for 10 minutes. He said, it comes right back as soon as you stop. But, you you know, if you're lucky, you've got the energy to carry on. But if you haven't got the, lucky, you haven't got the energy, it'll stay with you until you're satisfied again. So you, it doesn't get rid of it like that. And he's, but he did say that the appetite never completely goes away. As with cigarettes. You could always have another one if you wanted to. And the, the Britty would be hovering in the background waiting to be revivified. You know, there is a personality still inside there. Right. There are legions of diverse, contrary wills in the ununified soul. The re the, those um, contrary wills we call, by the technical yogic term, vritti. And remember, the Patanjali starts with yoga is um, yoga chitta, vritti niroda. Yoga, is, the yoga mind is the mind without vrittis vibrating inside it. And you meditate to get rid of those vrittis. You get rid of them by allowing them to run down, by not identifying with them without, without calling them you. They're thought processes which speak for themselves inside your head, even when you're silent. Okay? 
There are legions of diverse contrary wills in the ununified soul, driving the soul to inflict harm on itself. We do not like to be dictated to from outside. Should we not equally refuse to be dictated to by impulses and disorderly energies on the inside? Okay? Libra means the balance. Liberty depends on this balance. What upsets our balance takes away our freedom. There is no freedom, no free decision for us if we allow ourselves to be eternally driven by uncontrolled impulses. Uncontrolled impulses. Okay? You have impulses inside you. You have addictions inside, inside you. You do need food. You know? How much food you need, we're now going to discuss from a technical aspect. But Eugene would say, find out how much you need. You know? You, you, no one can tell you that. Your mother will fill your plates up, you know, she doesn't care how much you eat as long as you keep coming home. But with other things with you, you have to explore for yourself and find out said, how much is right for you. Do you remember when you said uh, that women marry a handsome man? and then they feed him up and make him fat so that no other woman will touch him. Because <laughs> <laughs> it is a thing that you do, but mothers yes. do too. <laughs> they do. Right, now, okay, so that's the point I wanted to get across in terms of this sacrifice. The, the, you, don't just, you, can, you don't just have to fast with food. If you do fast with food, along with the health benefits, that, which there undoubtedly are, you've got this other processes of these things will come along and literally start to have a chat with you. They'll discuss things with you. They'll tell you what you're doing. You know, this, that, and they'll talk you out of it if possible. Think of your friends and, and the number of times I've got a friend who says giving up cigarettes is dead easy. I've done it hundreds of times. <laughs> you know, um, absolutely. You, you get talked out of it. Notice you're getting talked out of it. It's a rational process. These things talk to you. In the Bible, they're demons. They're devils. And they come and talk to you. I've got a cigarette. You know, there's no one here. So they've all gone out. I'm just a bit cracked now. They'd still think you've given up. You, know? you can hear these voices talking to you. And you can understand <coughs> why people fall for it. And of course, in the olden days, when if you heard a voice, it was definitely um, outside of you. It was a devil. You can project these out into the world. And the other damn thing is, if you are giving up, all your friends offer you find people in the street will offer you cigarettes. <laughs> Never happens when you're desperate for one and you've got to, you can't find a machine. But if, as soon as you give up, people come up to you and say, you want a fact? <laughs> right. Okay. Rupert Sheldrake, on nutrition. Uh, that, all that using holiday stuff was from Health and Spiritual Freedom from the Cavendish, Cavendish books. Uh, written in 1956 and absolutely um, solid stuff. Well, well worth reading. Dr. Rupert Sheldrake on nutrition in Science Set Free. Science Set Free is the American version of what he called the science delusion over here, which was not his title anyway. It was suggested to him by the publishers, apparently. And he, this is taken from his talk. It was a, a transcript which I, which I found, and it's very similar to his talks um, that he talks um, whenever he does the talks on the science delusion. The science delusion is he takes... 10 paradigm ideas of modern science. Initially, he wanted to disprove a few and um, agree with a few, but he found that when he looked at all of them, when he ag examined them all, they disappeared. In other words, they were found to be a house of cards, that they were not fixed research-based ideas at all, including the speed of light and the measurement of gravitation on the Earth, all of these things were highly mutable. Okay? When he looked at nutrition, guess what? He found there wasn't a great deal of research there, and his response is quite clear. I'm just going to read from this. It's a big chunk, and it's from, taken from one of his, from his lectures. In the late 1970s, Paul Webb reinvestigated human energy balances in his laboratory. What you have to remember is in about the 1850s, up until about the 1850s, everybody, the physicists, the chemists, etc., and the, the um, medics at the time, thought that the human being was a living structure. They were vitalists, is the name we give to them in philosophy. Vitalists mean they believed that there was a life energy inside human beings, exactly what we've been talking about here. The human beings were a special order of machine. 
Animals were a special order of type of machine, but they didn't know much about machines. The only things they had there in comparison with machines would be clockwork. That was the most sophisticated sort of form of machine that they had. As things got more and more structured in, this, in the sciences, they started to look at human beings as living machines that were obeying just the laws of physics and chemistry. And there was one particular guy, Hermann von Helmholtz, who was a German uh, doctor in the army, who examined um, little parts of, of animals. He used, well, Galvani had just started uh, galvanized, you know, you have the galvanic systems where you, you actually hit um, a frog's leg it was with a, an electrical input and the leg moves. He was measuring the output, checking, trying to check how much energy you got out, how much energy you put in. It was too complicated for him. So he fell back on the, on the theory and just said, they must be living machines because there's only the law of physics and chemistry in the world, apparently, according to, to, to Sheldrake. Okay, in the uh, late 1970s, Paul Webb reinvestigated human energy balances in his laboratory in Ohio with surprising results. The figures simply did not add up, especially when subjects were overeating or undereating. Okay, what he found that some people who were overeating were not getting, there was, uh, there was a, a distinction of a fit, 20% of the, uh, the energy they should have had, they didn't seem to have. Other people who were under-eating and exercising a lot seemed to have 25% more energy than they should have from the food that they were eating. There was a discrepancy. And this guy couldn't understand what it was. He, um, he was working on quite sophisticated system in the 1970s. It hadn't been examined properly since the 80s, 1899. Can you imagine that? Nobody had researched it since 1899. People called that water and Benedict. And they also found anomalies, and they decided to restructure it, to change the maths, so that it, it, well, it did actually come out mechanistically, that the food you put in came out in <coughs> oxygen, in chemicals, in faces, and in what in, in. What, what Sheldrake's saying is they admitted that they altered the maths to make the results fit, both guys, characters, including well. Uh, Paul Webb's results are on the net, actually, so you can actually read it. The figures, the figures simply did not add up, especially when subjects were overeating or undereating. Webb also found puzzling discrepancies in other previous studies. He concluded, the more careful the study, the more clearly there is evidence of energy not accounted for. Okay? What he's saying there is that when you look at it, human beings seem to have more energy than they should, or in some cases a lot less energy than they should, but it never tallies right up. Of course, his response is we need more sensitive machines. But Sheldrake's point is the results of the, of the tests they did showed that human beings were not responding like living machines. There was more energy or less energy. It never fitted exactly. Okay? But the law still was established and expounded that we are living machines and we better work only on the laws of physics. And if you eat more, you get more energy. If you eat less, you get less energy. Simple. Laws of physics. Okay? He's saying it's not grounded on, on, on results. It's the theory is being put forward, and the theory rules without any real results. Okay? In Webb's own experiments, he took a careful tally of the food eaten over a three-week period, changes in body weight, heat, and other forms of energy output, as well as measuring rates of oxygen consumption, carbon dioxide from production, he found that more energy was being used than he could explain. He did not question the law of conservation of energy, but instead suggested that there was as yet unrecognized and unmeasured kind of energy which he called X. Taking all the studies together, X was uh, on average 27% of the total metabolic expenditure. In other words, more than a quarter of the energy was unaccounted for. Okay. However, a modern-day vitalist could assert that there is a vital force work in living organisms over and above the standard forms of energy known to physics. A yogi could speak in terms of prana, or an acupuncturist in terms of chi. Okay? These guys are finding the same results, but they're just saying there's, there's something happening here that the, the results show. He's saying they're not even admitting the fact that, okay, there might still be something. Not saying that there is, saying, but there might still be something. So we do need more sensitive information. 
But until then, let's just hold it over and say, at the moment, it looks like there's something else in there as well. You know? So when you get a person, you put them in a totally sealed environment, so all the uh, gases going in, all the gases coming out, I don't want to go into more detail than that. Um, food going in, foods coming out, all that sort of process is measured and weighed, doesn't tally. That's all he's saying. And why don't they just admit it? <laughs> okay. Because, of course, chi and prana can't possibly exist. Although most people do not realize it, there's a shocking possibility, possibility that living organisms draw upon forms of energy over and above those recognized by standard physics and chemistry. One easy starting point for research would be to find out how some people and other animals seem to survive even though they eat very little food. It is well established that eating much less than usual can have beneficial effects. A reduced intake of calories or calorific restriction improves health, slows down the aging process, and increases lifespan in a wide variety of species, including yeast, nematode worms, fruit flies, fish, rodents, dogs, and people. Which is what had kicked off Michael Mosley in the first instance. He was going to America to see a guy who was 40-odd, looked 22, and lived on something like about 600 calories a day. Every day. The fascinating thing was, he ate fruit, but he only ate the skins. He didn't eat the flesh. Sometimes he ate the seeds. Because there's more goodness in them, and the rest is just starch. It's just carbohydrate. So, and this guy really did look extremely well. I mean, all his bloods and everything were those of a 22-year-old guy. So this restrict diet was certainly working for him. Okay, so whether or not you know, like you live longer, or whether it just seems longer because you only have six. <laughs> <laughs> In 2010, a team from the Indian Defence Institute of Physiology noticed the Indian Defence Institute, so it's the Indian Army, and Allied Sciences investigated an 83-year-old yogi called Prahladyani who lived in the temple town of An Anbaji in Gujarat. His devotees claimed that he had not eaten for 70 years. <laughs> now, at this point, as V pointed out, you start to smell a rat here, don't you? But let's carry on. Um, he had not eaten for 70 years. In the DIPAS study, he was kept for two weeks in a hospital under continuous observation and filmed on CCTV cameras. He had several baths and gargled but the medical team confirmed that he ate and drank nothing. In other words, when they gargled, he spat out what was in the glass and passed no urine or feces. A previous medical investigation in 2003 had given similar results. But Sheldrake goes on to say in the talk that we recorded when he came here was that what amazed them was he didn't have any of the reactions. When you go on a fast within four or five hours, of not eating, your body starts to change its metabolic rate. The heart rate tends to increase. This goes on for several hours. There are lots of changes that go on inside your stomach. None of them happened in this guy. He was stable. You know, he didn't urinate for two weeks. That's a good trick. <laughs> you know, so if, and he's been watched and filmed all the time. Now, yes, you say, oh, he found some way of sneaking the stuff in. Okay. Quite prefer to believe that, but you, what you have to say, if results count in science, the results say he didn't eat for two weeks. And not only that, but his body didn't show any signs of panicking about the fact that he wasn't eating. So if he was just fasting for two weeks, which is not a long time to go without food, to go without water for six days is quite tricky. You know? So, what the scientist said very intelligently was he had a beard, he could have been hiding things in his beard. What a giveaway, okay? Which I thought of that. The director of DIPAS said, if a person starts fasting, there will be some changes in his metabolism, but in his case, we did not find any. This is an important point, because surviving a two-week fast in is itself not particularly impressive. Most people could do that, but there would be very noticeable physiological changes while they did so. Okay, so this guy is doing something that we don't know what of. Plus these fellows that get buried alive for three or four days, you know, they're sealed and they're not using very much oxygen at all because they've only got what's inside the, the thing with them. And lots of people, lots of scientists have examined this. Okay? So what he's saying is that 
not only is this flexible from a yogi point of view, when you look at the science, you realize it's a lot more flexible than you thought. That it isn't fixed. And surely in the talk that we had also went on to say, don't forget, nutrition is in a hell of a state as a science. We've got over a billion people obese. We've been recommending diets now for the last 50 years. Most of them don't seem to work. You know, we've got a lot of people dying from diseases of not being able to, to structure the, the intake of food. We don't seem to know what human beings need and what they don't need. Now, this is where it gets exciting and hot off the presses. Did anybody see the um, Life Science? Did anybody see the radio program? Did anybody hear the radio program, the Life Scientific, this week? Fascinating. He did. It was a, um, an intensive care specialist who was also a mountaineer and who'd done a great deal of work on army guys, managed them to increase their heart size with exercise. So I'll read the blurb and then I'll read some of the, the stuff which he was saying. Now, this is not food. But remember, Eugene has asked us to broaden our concept of what a fast might be. This is to do with what the body actually needs. And in other words, how this thing can respond to its environment, just how flexible we can be. Okay? Professor Hugh Montgomery is an intensive care physician and a researcher at University College Hospital in London. His work has taken him to the Himalayas, where he and colleagues were studying the effects of oxygen uptake at high altitude. Okay? The findings were surprising and have implications for patients in intensive care. Jim Al-Khalili talks to Hugh Montgomery about the gene for fitness and how mountaineers have influenced intensive care medicine. That's the BBC blurb. Listening to the talk, and it's on Listen Again, it's only 28 minutes, 29 minutes, it's worth listening to because he seems a very reasonable guy, very intelligent. He didn't expect the results he got. What they did is they took uh, exercise machines, bikes and stuff like that, up the Himalayas. At certain, temp at certain levels, you get very, very low intakes of oxygen. And he wanted to explore this and see what people could do. Because the Sherpas seem to handle it up there, and mountaineers get used to it. And he said what they thought would happen was what would happen with the army guys when they exercise. Your heart gets more, it gets stronger and larger. Your blood gets enriched with hemoglobin so you can carry more oxygen. You feel incredibly fit, you know, and you eat more food. What they've been finding in intensive care is sometimes if you give more food to people and more oxygen, they die. Yet their body seems to need it. The body is going down, is, is, is showing all the signs of starvation. Their lungs are showing all the signs that they need oxygen. And yet when you give it to them, they die. They don't know why. Part of the answer why it's going to affect intensive care, he says, is when they went up there, he started to talk uh, uh, 10 minutes in, so if you, if you just want the potted version, go for listen again, you can click on 10 minutes, he starts talking about it. Um, he talks about the uptake of oxygen at high altitude acclimatization. <coughs> it's about the body's reducing use of oxygen, not as previously thought, by increasing the supply, richer blood, stronger heart muscles. Okay? What he said was when he got there, the first time he got there, he, was, he went over, it took him four and a half hours to climb a certain height. He was at 8,000 8, meters, 8,200 meters above sea level. At that level, you're getting so high up, there's very little air above you, so there's the, the, the density of the air is very refined, so you're not getting anything like the amount of oxygen through your system when you breathe. So it takes, took him four and, a half, four and a half hours to climb this particular thing. level. When he got there, somebody came for him and said, there's a girl that's dying down back in the station where you go, could you, back, could you come down and treat her? So he dashes back down. Okay, he's only been up there a day. Treats the girl, walks back to where he was, took him 40 minutes. Okay? So he's climbing on a mountain, not Everest, but the one facing Everest. He said that shook him because his body had acclimatized within one day. What they were then finding was that it was nothing to do, his heart wouldn't have had time to change, his blood chemistry would not have had time to change, all his systems would have not had time to change. What had happened, his body was using less oxygen. And then when they got back to 8,200 8, 8, meters, and they got the exercise bikes out, 
the levels at which the people, the climbers were working on the bikes were normal levels of, of intensity with levels of oxygen in their bloodstream. If they were happening in his intensive care unit, he'd say these people were going to die within half an hour. The blood gases were incredibly low. So what's happening is they've got much less oxygen inside them and they're working fine. Can I add something to that, Al? Um, I, I know for a fact that the hyperbaric chambers in uh, Bupa mm -hmm. um, are accepting patients. Uh, I'll give you an example, a friend of mine plays for Liverpool. Yep. Uh, and, and for sports injuries, they were putting the uh, the athletes, the footballers, into hyperbaric chambers yep. uh, for a certain length of time. And apparently they were getting results by uh, you know uh, taking the pressures, like a diver gets the bends. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, and apparently they were get, they're getting really really good results in the chambers to right. do with the, the, the you know the levels of um, oxygen in the body. Yeah. So it's very similar to what you're saying, isn't That's it? That's right. I remember there's one talk actually by Eugene where he talks about Cahoolan in the uh, in the Celtic myth going into battle situation and going through his battle regime where he slows his breathing right down. He starts to move very slowly and become he starts to literally glow as he started to fight. And it, it, this is in the, um, in the, the uh, Celtic, Celtic uh, poems. And Eugene was saying, what he's doing there is advanced martial arts. He's actually working on his body and intensifying the energy which he's getting from his body, going into that thing. Now, we didn't go any further on, on with that. But it is fascinating that the science is actually saying, when you look, and this is what Sheldrake would say, this is what, we, what was actually science. You do the, the tests. You don't say what must happen and jiggery pokery with the maths. What you do is you do the test and say, what the hell's happening? So what is happening here, this fellow said, is that they're finding that the body is adjusting to the super low levels of oxygen. Now what he says is, he was doing it on himself. He said he felt fine. He felt as fit as a butcher's dog, he said. Obviously, of course, person. He said he felt as fit as a butcher's dog. And he thought he was well fed, but when he actually looked at his actual um, log, he'd eaten one Mars bar in two and a half days. That's all he'd eaten. And he shared it with a friend, he said. And he felt very fit, and not hungry at all. And part of the system he was saying is that you know your body is working well on this because he said, I was actually digesting my own body. I was digesting my own fat and muscle which when it happens to people in the intensive care, we say they're going terminal, they're actually digesting themselves. But he said it was only the things that the body could easily do without. Plus, I didn't feel hungry, so I was not desperate to replace the food. My body was sort of saying, this is what you need to do in this situation. Allow it to happen. So he didn't, it wasn't because he was hungry and he, d he didn't have the food, they had plenty there. He didn't even feel hungry and he felt extremely well. So he was saying, we don't really know what's happening here, but it seems as if the body seems to go into repair mode, which is just what we've been saying with the Michael Means stuff that you've been saying about the naturopathic thing. If you give your body a break, there seems to be something inside us, a healing process, which is triggered by taking in less. And the, the words he uses, because he was very good about this, he said, what we're finding in intensive care is that rather with than flood the body with extra fuel, oxygen, calories, etc., it's better to allow the body to fine tune itself and use what's available. It will, you know, literally sort itself out in terms of what it needs and fine tune its own organs. I remember somebody saying that they, this, they were really amazed in Vietnam. The Americans they were stung by the fact that often they go around across the battlefield. And the helicopters could only take a certain number of fellows. So they'd take the ones who were, you know, showed signs of looking like they could be saved. And they'd leave the guys who literally were in com coma states and deeply unconscious and really badly bashed about. They'd take the other guys back to the hospital unit. Half of them would die, you know, because as soon as they, they clicked into intensive care, they'd be giving them drip, they'd be giving them oxygen. They'd go back to the battlefield the following day. Some of the fellows don't think were still alive. They dropped into this deep coma state. You know, they were probably cold. They were probably very still. Nobody disturbed them. They were still ticking over fine. 
when they took them back to intensive care, built them with stuff they opened up there. So there was something going, they actually said, and from this I'm sure Andrew will, will, will chip in, that you know, a lot of processes now, they actually slow the human system right down when they work on it. You know, they, they, they do the deep freezing thing, they take you right down to very, very cold temperatures, and they'll often leave you in those states for six or seven days. No food, no drips, nothing. In just hands. Yeah. Right, I rest my case, that's me done. Any questions? And um, there's, a, there's a, just a few more bits of things from the other side. Yeah, yeah. 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 In fact, he finishes up on the, in the program of that. Um, it's worth listening to because he, he's really, as I say, he's really nice guy. He says, as far as he's concerned, in his unit, they're now. The point he makes, of course, is the, is the, is the point Carol made that if you don't eat any food at all, you'll die. How long it takes you is very strange, and it varies tremendously for the different people. And we know a lot about this nowadays because there have been hunger strikers for, for the last century. But so he's fascinated, and science has got to come to grips with the fact that how much less is critical because half, when they feed half to rats, they reduce their intake by half the natural amount, they live twice as long. And <coughs> they're far healthier, their disease level drops. So eating more, which we all thought was going to be good for us, you know, and our, our grandfather, like my grandfather saying, you know, we, we've got to survive, we've got to eat everything that's put in front of us, so to speak. It's the wrong advice. For, you know. But finding out just what is right, science is looking into. Halliday's point ages ago is it'll be different for, for different people. It'll certainly be different for you at different times of your life. So you're not a fixed, finalized thing. You've got to keep on experimenting. And I know that he kept on fasting and changing his diet right until the end of his life. You know, um, There were things he found he couldn't eat anymore, things he found he enjoyed you know, doing still. So th you have to literally, it's an interaction between you and your environment and that you should participate that. It's a play. It's a game of life, you know, and it isn't fixed, and it isn't in any way repetitive and, and structured in a fixed way. It's constantly changing. It's a fluid interaction, and your body responds very well to a sensitive and intelligent experimentation. Is there any conclusion about how this Indian yoga did? Oh, done it. Sheldrake says if you look through medieval Catholicism, mm -hmm. and don't forget, they really did examine people in those days. You know, I mean, when they said they, you know, we don't eat, they'd say, okay, and they just left them dead in a cell, you know, and that was it. And came back, and if he was still alive in three weeks' time, okay, he might be right. You know, I mean, the, the, there are standard. I've got a, I used to have a book. I have got it somewhere, which is about the way you find out how, what a saint is. And one of the things about a saint is his body is decomposed. Now, St. Francis Xavier is a big case. I mean, he's still in a glass box. You can go and look at it. He doesn't look all that well, but he certainly hasn't <laughs> decomposed. You know. Now, some people decompose extremely rapidly. You know, they, they stink very quickly. And there are standard states of, of these sort of things which people have, have gone into. Now. Part of the sainthood is that you, you don't decompose. At all, you know. So the 21 days after death, the body is still soft. Now that's a good trick to do. You know, if that's jibbery pokery, how the hell do you jibbery pokery that one? And one of the things is, a lot of people in monasteries used to live without food. You know, Padre Pio was actually bleeding from his hands and his feet every day of his life. He had the stigmata. Blood was pouring out of his hands and his feet. Where was it coming from? He didn't have any cuts on him. You know, this it came through the skin surface. Blood just came out. Tremendous amount of blood loss. Yes, no, it's just stigmatism. It's just stigmatism. Hang on. He bleeds from these places. Yes, there are places of Christ, but it's actual blood coming out. You measure it. It's his blood. These processes need to be examined because something's going on. And when there's a placebo response, which means that you get yourself better from illnesses, you know, without or despite the chemistry that you do or don't take to a level of 16%, that's a question, isn't it, rather than 
But this, you know, they used to say, oh, it's only, only the placebo effect. And lots of people, 16% of people will get well just because they think it's the right stuff. Well, how the hell is the mind doing that? Because if they don't think the medicine's going to work, they don't get better. So the mind is healing them in the first place. And how do you know when you give them penicillin? It isn't the mind that believes in that because some people take penicillin and still don't get better. You know, so the work, the chemicals that work, so to speak, it, it's going to be very, very difficult to say, separating out what is the mind and what is actually the drug. And who doesn't want to know that? Well, the drug companies that invest vast amounts of stuff into, into processes to get you taking the medicine. You have to be very careful. Now they would say, be very careful about before what you put inside yourself and what you don't. And read up on the drug companies, because if you know anybody who works for a drug company, and we do, the practices are rather shaky, shall we say. Yeah. We're looking into that quite a bit, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. It needs looking into. And of course, we all need them. And there's lots of stuff which they do help with. So you've got to do everything with a pinch of salt. But there's no excuse for not looking into it yourself because you're going to need these people, you're going to use them at some time, check them out. You know, I particularly had problems with, with chemistry that they asked me to take at one time in my life. And I, I was amazed at literally the, the stuff I was being given because it wasn't right for what I had. You know, and I could find that out, why couldn't they? But, you know, by the same token, an awful lot of the stuff they did give me made me feel a hell of a lot better and did get me through processes. You need to look and you need to push and pull, you know. And that guy over there on the telephone helped me a great deal by just calming me down. You know, when you think you're dying, someone telling you you're not dying is very, very good for you. You know, it's a, it changes, it's better, better than any placebo, I think. No, you're not dying. You know, so go to work, you know. Yeah, it's a, that sort of thing is what you need. But the process is so, you know, you see yourself responding like that and just say, well, all that stuff about the chi and the prana and stuff, if you do the exercises and you do the tai chi or you do the yoga exercises and you start to feel better, you say, well, maybe. You know, this is research I'm doing. You know, I'm a, what is it, a work in progress. This is a research I'm doing on me. And for me, if I do the exercises, I feel better. I used to have a friend who was a faith healer. And I'd say, you know, how does it work? And he said, well, I don't think about it as working, and I don't call myself a faith healer. He said, I'm a Christian, and if I pray a lot, an awful lot of coincidences happen. <laughs> he said, Let it, just leave it at that. You know, and you can say, well, when I do the exercises, when I meditate, a lot of coincidences happen. Life seems to get better in some way. It seems to flow, which is what all the books say. Suck it and see. If it works, it works. And if it doesn't work, don't do it again. You, you know, you, what have you lost? You know, you've explored, you spent a bit of time doing some exercise, and everybody says that's bad. You know? But essentially, Eugene would say, the problems in the body are usually caused by tension, which is essentially fear, which is inhibited pro natural processes and the flow of energy. That's why Tai Chi works so very well. You know, it, it's a form of exercise with absolutely no tension, essentially mm -hmm. inside it. Yoga is a, a different way of, get, of getting into the same thing and trying to release energies and express them and allow them to come out. Because yeah. tension is a big Sorry. problem. Sorry. Um, that's what Lynn and I were saying, isn't she, when he's talking about people in serious accidents and they get trapped in small places and after a few days an awful lot of them die. But in actual fact, they're not dying of starvation, they're dying of fear. Mm -hmm. Because you can live a lot longer than that. Yeah. Just Any thoughts, any questions? It's 20 past 10. Thank you very much, Alan. Oh, thank you very much, Alan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. We have some dates for these good people, do we not? We do. Yes. Um, just for some sort of prior notice, really. The next talk here will be November the 30th, which is a Friday night. Uh -huh. no, no subject. We don't know what the subject is yet. Um, is Overeating, I think. <laughs> <laughs> With Christmas coming on. Is that one day... Feasting. One day workshop on November the 24th, yeah. which is in Acton. Some of you come to Trigonos where we do some sacred drama work, where we reenact things. We've got uh, 
uh, one day coming off in Acton, which is just this side, just this side of Crew. Acton is a lovely little church hall place. A beautiful church, by the way. And we're going to do some um, sacred drama there. We're not quite sure yet because we're thinking of moving into a, a system which is family based, essentially exploring family relationships. But we don't know yet. We might not be able to do that in this one place. But if you're interested in that, we'll, we'll post something up in the not too distant and then there's always Trigonos as well, which we, we run, which is great, is it not? Yeah. Those people who go really enjoy it. And it's a lovely place, yeah. and the food's good. Yeah. And we got to it. Mm. The next one of those is March 22nd, but there's only one room left in that. Yeah. Yeah. Apart from that, it's fully booked. And then there's the Christmas meeting, um, which is December the 16th. Yeah. We don't do anything for that. We just prepare something. And if you wanted to come along with a poem or a song, or we get music, we get uh, poetry, we get something you've written yourself, something you found that you find humorous, Christmassy, please do. It tends to to be good. We enjoy it a lot, and you're very welcome to come to that. Um, you don't have to do anything. If you want to do something, that's fine. If you don't want to just, if you just want to listen, that's great too. Because as with this, consciousness is everything. You being here as a conscious being, you think you're not doing it. You maybe think you're listening to a lecture, but of course you're not. You change the lecture by your very presence here. You, you lift me and other people around you by your presence. This consciousness in you is terribly important. This is all about being conscious. None of these processes, these forms inside, as the Heart Sutra tells us, the whole universe is form and nothingness, and the nothingness is watching the form. And the nothingness is feeding and supporting the form. Become nothingness. When you meditate, you're actually nullifying yourself. You're becoming nothing. Because the nothing is the great thing which contains the whole process. And that's the part which is most creative. The form cannot create itself. The nothingness creates the form. This thing comes out of nothing. This thing comes out of nothing. The whole process is a living nothingness that's watching and developing itself.